And then please stay standing for the reading of God's word. Um, We're doing Proverbs 26, 4 through 5. And if you have the Bible from the back, it's on page 579. So Proverbs 26, 4 through 5. Don't answer a fool according to his foolishness, or you'll be like him yourself. Answer a fool according to his foolishness, or he'll become wise in his own eyes. You may be seated. So if you're just joining us today, uh, this is week three of our summer series in the book of Proverbs. And last week we talked about how the first nine chapters of Proverbs uh, the father is speaking to his son, and it's Solomon speaking to his son or sons, um, and he's warning them uh, by, by talking about two voices. And he's basically like, son, in life you have the option of listening to one of two voices, either the voice of Lady Folly, who will only exploit you and leave you for dead, that's always the path of foolishness, or there's the voice of Lady Wisdom. And so as we dug into it and looked at it, we realized that the book of Proverbs is actually the Lord's gracious invitation to relationship with himself because he himself is wisdom. And so either we're moving toward him or we're moving away from him. Either either we're walking toward life or walking toward death, that he is the place, the only place where life is found and our desires are truly satisfied. And that's, that's kind of where we left off last week. And so for today, we're gonna pick up that desire thing. If, if our desires are only truly satisfied in him, we have to reckon with our desires because all of us have desires and desires are very, very strong things, right? And so we want things. We want them our way when we want them. We desire control. We desire to be respected. We desire to be right. We desire vindication, and sometimes, if we're honest, we even desire revenge. We'll even continue to argue, even when we've been convinced that we're wrong, we'll continue to argue just because we desire to be right, or at least viewed as right in winning the argument. And so those desires, if we listen to them, drive us to the voice of Lady Folly, and our desires lead us into a place of foolishness. And like we talked about last week, we're all the fool. We're all born into sin. We, by default, are foolish people. And so how many times have we said or done something and just even a a moment or maybe the next day or maybe when we're laying in bed that night, later we think back and be like, I'm such a fool, I'm such an idiot. Why did I say that? Or why did I do that? Why did I respond in that way? And how often has our foolishness created a conflict with someone else? And everybody in there, your foolishness led to conflict, okay? All of us. And so James spells it out for us. We've we've said this before. James is kind of the the New Testament book of wisdom. But James says, what is the source of wars and fights among you? What's the source of your conflicts? Don't they come from your passions that wage war within you? You desire, there's that desire word, and you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and wage war. Two verses full of conflict because of the desires that all of us have in us. And when we try to get those things satisfied ourselves by our own ways, listening to the voice of foolishness, it only leads us down a path of war and destruction. And so our desires often get us into conflict with others. And so conflict happens when we sin against others or when they sin against us and there's hurt and where there's injustice But it's not always sinful things. Sometimes conflict just comes from inconvenience or a simple misunderstanding. But then because our desire is to like get control of the thing, it blows up into conflict and leads us into sinful place. But some of those stresses and inconveniences and misunderstandings are often agitated 
or magnified by other tensions and stresses. How many of you know you can come home from a hard day at work and you can be short with your family and it's not because of what they're doing necessarily, it's because you're carrying all the stress of your day, right? You carry in that conflict and you come into the house and you want the desire just for peace and control and everybody do what I say and when that doesn't happen, what happens in here? It's like, (laughs) and you blow. There's an acronym called HALT, some of you are familiar with. It's be careful when you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. Those are those, those situations where we, uh, they just tend to pour gas on the fire and we're more irritable, that's where we get hangry from. But our desires within us lead us into a place of conflict many times. So before we get into what we just read, chapter 26, verse four and five, let, we're gonna take a flyby of just a handful of Proverbs leading up to chapter 26. So they're gonna be on the screen. But I want you as we read these, pay attention to the factors contributing to conflict. Look for the factors contributing to conflict and see if you can identify with these things. Uh, Proverbs 12, 16. Fools show their annoyance at once, but the prudent overlook an insult. Where there is strife, there is pride. But wisdom is found in those who take advice. In 1429, whoever is patient has great understanding, but the one who is quick-tempered displays folly. And so I want you to yell back at me. uh, What do we see here as contributing factors to conflict? What are some of the things you can glean from just those three verses? What leads to conflict? Impatience, selfishness, what else you got? Pride. What else? Annoyance, temperament, anger, lack of humility, not willing to listen. Can you relate yet? Don't elbow your wife or your husband. Next slide, here are three more and then we'll move on. Again, observe what leads to conflict. 15.1, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. 15.18, a hot-tempered person stirs up conflict, but the one who is patient calms a quarrel. 18.6, a fool's lips lead to strife and his mouth provokes a beating. I kind of like that one. <laughs> it makes a point. What do we see here as factors contributing to conflict? Go ahead, call them out again. What do you see? Harsh words, words, anger, impatience, temper. temper, pride, someone just running their mouth, not reading the room, not knowing when to just shut up, right? They just wanna say what they have to say. But we all experience uh, these dynamics in life, whether it be with a spouse, a friend, a sibling, a coworker, a boss, a classmate, a parent, a child, a neighbor, a telemarketer, all of us know the reality of those things. And so what do we do? How do we handle the fools in our lives when they're provoking and when they just won't stop talking? How do we handle our own foolish desires for control in the situation and our own foolish desire to be right? How do we deal with that? So Proverbs 26, let's go there. It'll be on the screen too for us. Thanks, Sky. Proverbs 26, four and five says this. It says, don't answer a fool according to his foolishness or you'll be like him yourself. And then the very next verse says, answer a fool according to his foolishness or he'll become wise in his own eyes. Does that kind of make you go like, wait, what? You just told me not to do and then told me to do it. Like, I don't get it. How does that work? And Proverbs will often do this. It will hold up kind of two sides to the same coin. But how do we make sense of this? What are we supposed to do? Which one am I supposed to do? So let's break it down. Let's look at the first one. Verse four says, don't answer a fool 
Bill Murray, you know that great theologian who tends to be an actor on the side, he says, it's hard to win an argument with a smart person. It's near impossible to win an argument with a stupid person or with a fool. That gets at what verse four is saying, believe it or not. And so what are some reasons we wouldn't engage a fool? Proverbs don't answer a fool according to his foolishness. What are some reasons we wouldn't engage a fool? Number one, not my circus, not my monkeys. You ever heard that saying? It's like, not my problem, not my responsibility. I'm not stepping in it. And how many of you know that oftentimes is the wisest thing to do? Mind your own business. How many times have you told that to your kids? Like, don't step in it. That's between us. You don't need to speak to it. That's one reason why we don't engage a fool sometimes is it's not our responsibility. Number two, why wouldn't we engage a fool? Because maybe we aren't in a place personally to address it. Maybe we're too emotionally charged or too angry in the situation. And quickly we know that if we engage in that moment, we will then sink to that same level. Like it says, or you'll be like him yourself. You can ask my family, I give you permission. They will tell you how quickly I can revert to a 13 year old. And everyone will be like, stop. You are joining in the chaos. You're not helping the situation. Sometimes we need to not answer the fool according to their folly because we'll go right there. Some of you are shaking your head. Um, Or maybe you're not in a place because of your own pride. I had a friend who used to say this, uh, and I love it, and she said something to this effect. She said, if you have something hard to say to someone and it's easy for you to say it, then you probably aren't ready to have that conversation. If you have something hard to tell someone and it's really easy for you to say it, like you're almost looking forward to it, then you're probably not ready to have that conversation. What's that mean? It means you're probably entering it from a place of pride. You're not coming to that person in a place of humility and love and care. It's just like, oh, I'm gonna let them have it. They are so wrong, I'm gonna be the one to tell them. One reason maybe you shouldn't answer a fool is because maybe you aren't ready. I think uh, Tim Keller said something to this effect years ago. He said, you can't love someone that you think you're better than. When we come at each other from a place of pride, that's not love. And so if you want to step into a situation and correct a fool, we need to take a pause and maybe it's not time to answer the fool. What's another reason? Number three, uh, maybe you know for a fact it won't be received well and it will just stir up the foolishness and the sin and it may cause even more harm and it just wouldn't be responsible. Most of the time we don't know how people will react. We don't want to assume. But there are times I think when we know this just would not be a good idea. That would be another reason to not answer a fool. And fourth, I think we can sum it up. What is one reason, what's the main reason I wouldn't answer a fool according to his folly? Because maybe in that situation, it's the most loving thing to do is to not say anything right now. I'm sure we could go around the room and you could have stories where you realize maybe later, it probably would have been more loving not to say anything. Okay, so verse five. If those might be some of the reasons why not to answer or step into a situation, He says, answer a fool according to his foolishness. Well, when do I know when to do that? Like, what are some reasons we should engage a fool or someone who's going down a path that isn't wise, that is destructive and harmful and sinful, or has engaged us in a way that is is challenging and has stirred up a conflict? How do we know when to speak to that and when to step into it? Well, number one, it might be because we are genuinely concerned for their well-being or the well-being of others that they are on a path of foolishness that is costing them greatly. Maybe they are in danger or endangering somebody else. That would be a time to speak up and to say something. Another reason would be uh, that it would just be unloving to let someone continue in their folly and sin. 
And so that's why God gave children parents. If we never corrected our children, we're not loving them, are we? To just let them continue. We need to speak to the foolishness at times. Uh, That's why God gave us his word and his spirit is because we need to be saved from our folly. We need to be checked. Um, And when you do that, they, they may not always respond well. Maybe you've had hard conversations with people and it's like they just totally misrepresented what you said or didn't understand and they, they freaked out on you and they just lose it and it just does not go well. And you're like, well, that was a total waste. One reason sometimes to speak into someone's situation is because it's another data point. It's almost like your personnel file at work. If there's a person that's, that's challenging and they've never been called on it or never had a review and there's nothing in their file pointing to these issues that are chronic, there's nothing to look back on. But if you file things and you're having these conversations and you can look back and see a track record and maybe one day they'll see like, oh, I guess this is an issue for me. It's kind of the same thing with one another. If no one's ever stopped me and corrected me and say, hey, you're really short-tempered. I've noticed this a few times and I thought, you should know that. Do you, are you aware that you lose your temper really easily? If no one's ever told me that, do you think I'm gonna to listen to that person the first time? Probably not. I might lose it on them. But if it's a theme that I've heard from several people in my life, maybe over time that I would trust know me enough and love me enough, then maybe the Spirit of God would start to open my eyes and connect those dots. So sometimes it's the most loving thing to share with somebody, even if we know it's probably not gonna be received well, but if we can do it in a way that is loving, that would be a time to speak to the fool. Because if someone is never challenged, if they're never cautioned, if they're never corrected, bad things happen. And it doesn't matter if it's a business, an organization, a church, or a family. If people just are able to do whatever they wanna do, it brings destruction. All of us need people to speak to our folly. All of us need people to step into our lives. Otherwise, like it says, we will become wise in our own eyes. You ever been humbled? You ever think, whether it's something really stupid, like you thought you were good at something, like the people that show up on American Idol, it's like, who has been lying to you your whole life? Maybe you thought you were great at something only to find out later, like, I totally misread the situation or I'm totally not good at that. And no one ever told me. And now I look totally ridiculous. I wish somebody would have told me. If we don't have people speaking the truth to us in love, if we don't have people cautioning us and warning us and correcting us, then we get to this place where we just think we are it. And that's not a good place to be. The most loving thing to do sometimes is to engage the fool. Temper Longman says this. He says, Proverbs are not universally true laws, but circumstantially relevant principles. The wise person must assess whether this is a fool who will simply drain one's energy with no positive results or whether an answer will prove faithful to the fool or perhaps to those who overhear. The wise not only know the proverb, but also can read the circumstances and the people with whom they dialogue. Does that make sense? How do I know which, do I go with verse four or do I go with verse five? Temper saying, you gotta, that's where wisdom comes in. We can know the proverbs, but which way do I go? We need wisdom. We need the Lord's wisdom to discern this. And huge generalities here. There are generally two types of people. Those who engage conflict enthusiastically and those who avoid it at all costs. You know who you are. And so here's a little tiny thing that might come in handy sometime. How do I know which one to do? Well, if my default... If my default is to engage the fool, like you're the type of person who has no problem correcting people's grammar mid-sentence. If that's you, then maybe wisdom in a lot of circumstances is for you to slow your roll. It might be for you not to say something because maybe pride is an edge that you have coming out in that way. But if your default is to run away from conflict, there's probably a good chance that wisdom is for you. You need to speak up. 
And you need to stop being a coward and running away from having the hard conversation because by not having the conversation, you are actually very unloving to the other individual. So how do we know? How do we know the difference? How do we get the wisdom that we need to discern these things? What did we hear last week? The bookends of chapter one and the bookend of chapter nine. What was it? What's the whole crux of the Proverbs? How do we get wisdom? It's the fear of the Lord. It's the humility of heart, recognizing that he is God and I am not. I don't know how to do this. I can't do this without his help and without submitting to him. Because the thing is, is that our hearts mess with us, man. Our heads, our hearts, our abilities, they mess with us. Because in almost every conflict we have, most of us are very confident that the other person is the fool, right? It couldn't possibly be that we're wrong or we're the fool. When we have conflict, I can give you a hundred reasons why the other person is the idiot. And we're very slow to recognize that oh, I had a hand in this too. Like I'm actually pretty foolish and I was pursuing a desire that was not coming from a place of love or humility. Here's another encouraging thing. Every situation that we face in life, especially conflict and the hard stuff, every situation is never about just one person. It is never, this is that person's issue. I have nothing to do with it. The Lord doesn't have anything to teach me in this. It's all about them. That is never the case. Whenever something is going on, the Lord has something in it for everybody that that situation touches. Somebody say amen. Because if I think it's only about that one person, that's my pride coming out again, that I couldn't possibly have anything to learn from the situation and the Lord couldn't possibly be calling me to humble myself in any way. It's their issue. The Lord always has something to do in each of our hearts. So we got to humble ourselves. And as we come to the table today, we're reminded of just how foolish we all were. The Father in his love through Jesus creates a perfect world and says, you guys get to enjoy this. And within moments, we blow it all up because we're fools and made foolish decisions and continue to do so. And so Romans 5, 8, we quote a lot, but listen to Romans 5, 8 through 10. Listen to this. But God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners... Christ died for us. While we were still morons, while we were still foolishly listening to our own desires, pursuing what we wanted, running away from the voice of wisdom and truth, Christ died for us. How much more then, since we have now been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from wrath? For if while we were his enemies... We were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Then how much more, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life? Friends, we were all the fools in an ignorant, insane war against the God of the universe. And yet he moved toward us. He did verse five. He answered a fool according to my folly. He loved me enough to move toward me even though I was actively continuing to fight against him in my sin and my rebellion, my pride and my arrogance. He said, no, 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 no. I'm coming for you. Because of his great love for each one of us, he continued to move toward us. As we continued to blow up the situation and accuse him of things or ignore him, ignore his warnings, he answered the fool and came running toward us.